You are now entering a parallel universe. And wipe your feet on the way in. With Rob Hughes and Mark Riley. Hello and welcome to this YouTube edition of the Parallel Universe. It's a radio programme via the internet, which normally lands on a Thursday morning at 8am through Patreon. It's just £1 a week, but this is free on YouTube. Hope that you enjoy it. We are looking at an enemy from the 1st of August 1981 this time, aren't we, Bob? We are, mate, but hang on. What's going on with your hair? Look, mate, um, everybody wants a young audience these days, don't they? We know that. I mean, I work at the BBC. That's what everybody's looking for, a younger audience. Just thought I'd cut my hair in a kind of trendy fashion. kind. Of. You haven't cut your hair, have you? It's a wig. You haven't cut your hair because you haven't got that amount of hair to cut. It's a wig. All right, yeah. Um, just take it off. Just get it off. Take it off. No, you're not fooling anybody. Just take it off. Take it off. All right. Um, to 1981, then. Human League. Love Action.
Okay, so I think we all know that tune, don't we? And I need to say at this point in time that, um, yeah, it's normally a uh, an audio version of the Parallel Universe. On this occasion, it's filmed, as you can see. But I'm going to have to be rude from here on in and not look right down the bottle of the camera because I need to look at my mate, Mr. Bobby Hughes, who is over there in Yorkshire. Hello, Bobbitt. Hello, mate. How are you doing? I'm all right, thanks. I've, I've ditched the wig, as you can see. Yeah, you good. were right. It was the wrong thing to do, and I apologise profusely. Good. Oh, it takes a big man to, to admit that, I feel. Thank it you. really does. Okay. But anyway, let's crack on, shall we? Let's do this. So we're looking at the enemy, 1st of August 1981, Spandau Ballet on the cover, more of which later. Uh, but in the news here, you've got London's Institute of Contemporary Arts is staging its fifth Rock Week the end of August. Um, the six gigs are a blend of African-influenced music, reggae, jazz, funk and rock, and they feature the likes of Pig Bag, Depeche Mode, Night Doctor, and the people that goes on to list them all. So this was the age, wasn't it, 1981, where there was a lot of African rhythms in pop music. We called it the Burundi beat. That was prevalent, wasn't it? And it was such a kind of radical move at the time. It was a big deal. It was, and also world music was kind of coming through at that point mm. in time as well, wasn't it? And it was particularly championed by John Peel and Andy Kershaw. Um, but um, at the same time, you also had it in the charts. Of course, Bow Wow Wow were doing the Burundi beat, and Adam and the Ants were doing the Burundi beat. Everybody mm. was doing the Burundi beat, even the Burundis, I think. And so, mm. yeah, I mean, it's all over the place. But I actually played one of these ICA weeks. Oh, yeah. And if you look at it, at the ICA, there was a famous episode with Test Department, which we can get to in a short mm. while. Mm. Um, but it's it's absolutely uh, ridiculous that it's sponsored by Capital Radio. No offence to Capital Radio. But this is the kind of thing, really, that the BBC should have been all over. Definitely, yeah. The BBC Art Strand should have been all over it. Because uh, such an eclectic lineup here. Got like the decorators, uh, Dead or Alive, Way of the West, Birds with Ears, uh, Black Roots, Stimulin, the people. It's just all there for you. Yeah. So they missed a trick, I think. Yeah. And, uh, and I previously mentioned the test department. And I sometimes mm. say it was Neubarton, but it wasn't. It was test department, I'm pretty sure, who famously took a load of pneumatic drills in and various tools and just ripped the place up. And mm. I, I, I've also got this memory of there being some real problems with it because some people were suggesting it's on the mall, isn't it? It's, yes, it it's is. Yeah. Not far from Buckingham Palace. <laughs> and, and there were people <laughs> suggesting that the test department were trying to drill under the mall and trying to get in towards Buckingham Palace. And as we know, I mean, you didn't need all that. You didn't need all that gear <laughs> to break into Buckingham Palace. All you needed was a tiny little ladder um, or, you That's know, right. like and a, a spanner, I think. And yeah. a spanner and, yeah. uh, and be remotely aware of how to open a window from the outside. And you were in. Mm. We know. What yeah. was he called? Like, was it Michael Fagan or something? Uh, yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, he didn't need no need to drill through the floor. Ridiculous. It'd take him about six weeks anyway. But anyway, yeah. we do digress. But yeah, yeah, so the the ICA Rock Weeks were a famous thing, and they were great. You know, like I say, I did play yeah. one, very eclectic, and the kind of thing really that the BBC should have been over, and these days probably would be over. Yeah, definitely. Also in the news, Ultravox headline, a 20-day UK tour to coincide with the release of Rage in Eden, their new album. Uh, it contains nine originals recorded over two months in Cologne with renowned producer Connie Plank. Interesting, wasn't it? Connie Plank had this incredible reputation. Not only was he a producer, but he was a musician himself and an engineer and a, a soundscaper. So you listen to those records by Noy and Cluster and Harmonia, Kraftwerk, of course, and they've got his imprint all over them, aren't they? And so it wasn't surprising that you had this new generation of bands who wanted to use him because I, I think the Eurythmics used him, didn't they? The Bunnymen used him at one point, I think. You've got Ultravox here. Um, well, the Taurus as well. And later on, I, the, the story goes, doesn't it, that Brian Eno, who'd also worked with Connie Plank, wanted to, suggested that he produce the Joshua Tree for U2. But Connie Plank, so the story goes, said, I, I, I don't want to work with that singer. That was his, that was his reason. Well, okay, let's leave that bit hanging in the air. But it is, it's one of those things, isn't it? So quite patently, we've covered it before, actually, about Midjour and how he was kind of, well, he was all over the shop, wasn't he? So he started with Slick, who were a Bay City Rollers type band. Yeah, and Then yeah. he went to the Rich Kids, which was right, riding the new wave kind of element. And obviously, Glenn Matlock was in the band and was mm. a poppier element of the Pistols. So the story goes anyway. Yeah. But he also ended up in Visage and Ultravox and Thin Lizzy. So he was casting a pretty wide net, you would have to and say. There was, wasn't there a talk at the time as well of, of being sort of considered as a front man for the Pistols? 
I'm sure yes. he was in the frame in, in one form or another. I'm I sure he right, was. Right, you know, yeah. But I mean, in, in bringing in Connie Plank, so Vienna has been a massive hit, best yeah, yeah. known for the video and also for the fact that Joe Dolce, shut up your face, kept it off number one, <laughs> which must be, yeah. I'm sure, mid jaw, every time he hears the name Joe Dolce, he must just put oh. his head in his hand. Yeah. But yeah. so he's been through that. And obviously, Ultravox were best known for John Fox earlier on. Now they were best known for mid jaw. So, mm. what do you do? to try and get some real out-and-out credibility is to just, in a one fell swoop, bring in Connie Plank. So it's a pretty contrived move, isn't it? But you can't yeah. blame him for doing it. And maybe, you know, maybe you took him to a more interesting place. I don't know much of the uh, Ultravox stuff. Yeah, me neither. But yeah, he was very much in demand anyway. Let's put it that way. Uh, also in the news here, this sort of tickled me, uh, Rocket Records, Elton John's company, are back on course this week, despite the fact that their entire staff was fired last Wednesday. Uh, John Reed, Elton's manager, sacked everybody after he rang the office from Los Angeles and discovered that the heads of department he wanted to speak to were with, with either on holiday or out to lunch. A fairly reasonable state of affairs, considering he called at 1.50pm. All right. However, the affair was only an internal dispute, it says here, that has now blown over. Uh, nobody's lost their jobs. Everybody's happy again, says their press officer. Every office has the odd storm and a teacup, she added. Uh, the latest incident at Rocket has not been uh, the first of long-distance rows. Uh, Rocket's head of promotions, Arthur Sheriff, left in April 78 when, when Reed phoned from Australia after Elton's video for Ego didn't get, sh didn't get shown on top of the pops because the record itself had failed to make the top 30. <laughs> okay, so he got blamed for that. And also in 78, all of Rocket's staff was sacked, uh, was sacked when Reed arrived at London Airport and discovered nobody had sent a car to collect him. They were later reinstated. Ooh. So we have to dance merrily around this story, don't we? Because yeah. um, John Reed, not to be messed with. Um, mm. But he's in, the, he's in the biopic of Elton John and it gets pretty kind of frosty and gnarly at some points. And of course, he also managed Queen. And they mm. had the uh, tune, was it Flick of the Wrist? Flick of the yeah, Wrist yeah. and Your Dead Baby. Supposedly mm. about a previous manager. Who that could have been, me now know, obviously. Oh, yeah. But in, every office has a skirmish, but not every office has a John Reed. And so it just seems to be great. You're just like ringing up, nobody <laughs> answers the phone. You're all sacked. And then the next morning, you're going all a bit sheepish. and go, you're not sacked, actually. I'll, I'll, I'll let you off this time. Yeah, I know it was dinner time. It was a great story, but it just obviously you, you've got a sort of inclination here. It's sort of proper diva behaviour going on, haven't you? And it just reminded me, I know when Michael Parkinson passed away uh, a few weeks ago, didn't he? And they, one of the sh uh, clips that he showed of his chat show was Elton John on there. And he was going through a list of all the things that he'd done that would sort of really were way out of order. He said well, one of them included the fact he was out in the wind and he complained that the wind was too windy because somebody fix it. So that was what they were dealing with. If you worked at Rocket, that's what you were dealing with. All right. Definitely. And um, let's go over to Los Angeles now. So the cult band X returned to the UK in September following their debut visit last year. A two-week schedule has been lined up with details expected in the next two or three weeks. The rate, uh, latest record produced by Ray Manzarek of The Doors. Well, the thing about X is... They never cracked it over here, did they? No, they didn't. And they were part and parcel of the kind of slash movement over in Los Angeles. But when the fall went over to uh, America, we started off, we did two different tours, but one was just first on the East Coast and then on the West Coast. And we stayed in Los Angeles for um, uh, probably a week, maybe a bit more. Did mm. probably three or four gigs there. And we hung out with a guy called Claude Bessie, who then came over yeah. here, and worked with the Hacienda and the Icon video uh, department there. Um, but there, it was a great community of people based near Venice Beach round there but I'm not entirely sure how it happened but we ended up with no money to get home now normally bands would buy return tickets <laughs> that would be the sensible thing. It's just a thought, but we had no money to get home, and so we ended up having to do two gigs in one night, uh, the second of which was probably my favourite four gig of all time, which was called uh, The Non-Club, and we had um, Boyd Rice, who was opening for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I remember Boyd Rice playing um, with a fruit bat hanging from his arm. Uh, which can't be easy. It's about, it's about that big. It's terrible. Wow. It's about that wow. big. Um, but it, yeah, it was a brilliant gig. But that was the second one around about midnight on that day. And previously, we'd been to a, a fundraiser on our behalf. And we, I think we opened the show. And there were various different bands on. The Germs were playing, featuring oh, yeah. Derby Crash. And yeah. previously featuring uh, Belinda Carlisle on drums. But also X... 
and the thing that re really impressed all of us, they had a guitarist who, at the time who seemed ancient called Billy Zoom. Yeah. And he was a rockabilly guitarist, brilliant, brilliant player. He had the quiff, he had everything, but he was a top-notch player. But he'd mm. previously played, we'd been told, with Gene Vincent. So, oh, no. but he was probably only about 30, you know, right. but we were like, oh, who's this old geezer? Wow, yeah, he can yeah. play. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they raised money for us and we did the other benefit as well. And we eventually got home, which is probably not a happy ending to the story for a lot of people, but we did get home. Yeah. Also, we've got to mention, you mentioned the germs as well. The X were also in the film, were they? Decline of Western Civilization Part One, which was Penelope Sphere's uh, three part documentary. But the first one was about the LA punk scene, wasn't it? Which is. Uh, an eye opener. Yeah, uh, it's not as much of an eye opener as the, um, the, the, the <laughs> part two, <laughs> the heavy metal years. Which... Oh, that is that is just brilliant documentary making. Anyway, we should get to a tune, shouldn't we? I feel. I think we probably should. Yeah. Okay. So, um, back to nineteen eighty one, we go. The reason we're here As man and woman Is to love each other Take care of each other When love walks in the room Everybody stand up Oh, it's good, good, good Like Brigitte Bardot Look at the people in the streets, in the bars. We are all of us in the gutter. Some of us are looking at the stars. Look round the room. Life is unkind. So we are still in the parallel universe. We're looking at The Enemy from 1981. I'm Mark Riley. That is Rob Hughes. That is Howard Nock. That is Arthur the Staffy. Whilst in London somewhere, we've got Jason Reed. That is the full team. And um, where are we going next then, Bobbitt? All right, so we're still looking at The Enemy, 1st of August, 1981. Uh, portrait of the artist as a consumer this week, Randy California of Spirit. An interesting character, amazing guitar player. 
He was christened Randy California by um, Jimi Hendrix, wasn't he? Hendrix, he was in Jimmy James and the Blue Flames. He was part of the band and Hendrix was really taken with him, thought he was a brilliant player. And at that point, he was known as Randy Texas. So Hendrix said, I'm going to call you Randy California. I thought you were going to say that he changed his first name and called him Randy because... Anyway, it's not anyway. it's not post watershed, so we won't go there. But this no, is the but, portrait of the artist as a consumer. Now, mm. Spirit, like I say, a great band. They had that real loggerhead with um, Stairway to Heaven, didn't they? What was that about? That you was need a to court, educate me. That was a court case, wasn't it? Whereby um, Led Zeppelin um, was supposedly um, taking the riff from a Spirit tune for Stairway to Heaven. Do not remember that? I don't, mate. No, yeah. Sorry. Okay. No, yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it went on, um, but I think that Led Zeppelin won, as I remember. Yeah. If they okay. didn't, I don't want to see anybody in court. <laughs> I'm a coward and I've got no you money. You said it. You said it. But some of his, in- his answers are interesting here because they, they ask you, you know, standard questions here. What are your favourite records? What films do you like? Reading matters. Um, and then TV. I mean, bearing in mind, this is a, a guitar player from Los Angeles, you know, and he's saying, well, Star Trek, Barbara Woodhouse. So mm. for people of a certain age, they'll remember Barbara Woodhouse because she was the first person, certainly the first purple person I remember on British TV who was there just because she was really good at training dogs. She was like you a know. cross between Margaret Thatcher and the dog whisperer. Mm, yeah, <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I've never heard it put it that way, but yeah, I'll take that description. That's the best I can do, but um, and it's great because he also has it in the TV, the Old Grey Whistle Test. Now, Spirit, mm. I'm pretty sure, did appear on the Old Grey Whistle Test. Sure they did. Yeah. And, and the Benny Hill Show. Now, I'm quite sure they didn't appear on the Benny Hill Show. Uh, I'm sure they didn't. But the Benny Hill Show was, for some reason, huge in the States. It just became a real cult thing, didn't it? Did it? For whatever right. reason. Yeah, it did. Okay. And now things right. he talks about. It says jogging in Hyde Park. Now he lives in California. I don't know mm. how convenient that is for him. But just continuing, perhaps kind of the, the slightly self-obsessed angle here. Mm. Could be wrong. Uh, but he, they, they say, you know, reading matter. And he says the enemy. So, mm. obviously, already self-serving. And then yeah, he's got yeah. his favourite people at the bottom, bottom here. Levi Tate. Who's Levi Tate? Pardon my Don't guess. know, mate. Sorry, you got me there. Okay. Um, Eric Sev- Severide. And Max Bell. Now, Max Bell is a journalist for the NME, and one can only assume that Max Bell, at some point in time, interviewed Randy, Cal- uh, Randy California. Uh, but yeah, all good, it- all good. Absolutely. Also, English audiences is one of his favourite things. So you feel like he's trying to get on side here. That's really what he's doing, isn't he? Well, do you know what? I mean, you said to me before, creep, and I've written down here, <laughs> creep. So let's just say like it is, mate. So Randy what California. Creep. What a creep. Okay. Wow. Moving on. Okay. Cynthia Rose has a quick look here. There's a, a publication out called A Book With No Name, uh, and it stars, well, one of its cover stars is a guy called Peter Lewis, who is essentially a, a scenester in London. Uh, he's born in, he's from Telford, but he likes to go to London with his sister and goes to spend money on the clothes with no name, all right, and plunders and stuff. And The Book With No Name was just a catalogue of all these sort of movers and shakers of the new romantic movement and how they'd sort of influenced the culture, music, clothes, everything else. And he was one of them. And so it became almost an unofficial Bible, if you like, of the new romantic movement, this book. So it was very glossy, colourful, lots of makeup, huge hair, uh, but then an aesthetic that was about all about sort of perhaps enjoying the more elegant things in life, being different, being very peacocky, but also just trying to bring out a different kind of aesthetic that's coming out of the grey 70s into something a bit more colourful. That's what it was all about. There's a few interesting aspects to this, because one, which they do mention themselves, Spandau Ballet, in, in a short while. And I've never been a fan of Spandau Ballet, but, you know, they wrote some good tunes and they did the business, still going off and on, and Gary Kemp playing yeah. with Nick Mason, all that kind of stuff. Um, but they do mention the fact that they were working class, Right, defiantly yes. working class, and here they are. They're not, you, you know, if you look at the punk scene, obviously it was very easy to be working class and not have much money and and fit into the punk scene. But from their point of view, they were very dapper. They always mm. looked very dapper, even if it was like we used to joke that they used to wear tea towels and stuff. But whatever it was that they were actually wearing on top of the pops, yeah, they did look the part. They looked like there was some money behind them. Um, but also, it's 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 a Bowie thing once again. So if you look at how influential Bowie is 
punk movement was obviously influenced by David Bowie. And they mm. kind of tapped into, really, Ziggy Stardust and Aladdin Sane, didn't they? And Diamond Dogs, you would yeah, have to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. And so you look at Billy Idol and Susie Sue and those people, not the Pistols particularly, but the, Mott the Hoople were a big influence on The Clash. So the glam scene as well, but David Bowie. And then if you look at the, the next scene that came out of it all, which was the New Romantics, that's obviously tipping into young Americans of course, and is. station to station. If you yeah, hear yeah. the ballads that Spandau Ballet were coming out with, which didn't really connect with me, <clears throat> pardon me, they weren't a million miles away from Wild is a Wind on station to station. Yeah, sure. And sure. obviously you've got songs like Right, which were all influenced by the Philly yeah, sound yeah, and yeah. all that. So that there's a real join there. And I know that when they, um, they showed the blue plaque, unveiled the blue plaque uh, on Haddon Street, where mm. Ziggy was, the Ziggy mm. cover was um, photographed. Gary Kemp was there. Whenever there's anything to do with David Bowie on the TV, you can often find Gary Kemp right at the heart of it. So uh, it was, there is a thread to be run from Bowie in 1972 and 1975, right through the ensuing years, right up to about 1983, when, of course, Bowie came back and just swept everybody away with serious moonlight so. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, good point. And they saw, well, they don't really mention Bowie here in the interview. I mean, it's, it's Adrian Thrills goes up to Edinburgh where they're playing a club. So they decided to their credit, I suppose, they decided to just play clubs. They didn't want to play standard concert halls and they saw themselves very much as a club band. And because they saw themselves also as a kind of funk soul band, Clubland was, was their spiritual home. So they're aiming for that. And of course, the clothes play a massive part in that. Gary uh, Camp says, the thing is that soul music will always be the best music for a club scene. Uh, it's, it, was, it was the music of the 70s in the clubs, and it still is now, but it's never really been done properly in England. Most of the stuff is still coming out of New York. The only recent exceptions are people like Lynx and Light of the World. Uh, and as for a white group doing it, making the real dance music, I'm not sure if it can be done without falling into the obvious traps. So they're I'm, setting out the stall there. Go on. Yeah. I'm not sure if they're not being a little bit disingenuous there, because it is funny, isn't it? Because... Uh, with Bowie, they called Young American Plastic Soul. Mm. Now, they were influenced by Bowie. There is absolutely no doubt about it. But they, they mentioned other bands in here, even other British bands. But if they were to say that they were influenced to do soul music by somebody who was white, <laughs> who'd been influenced <laughs> by the Philadelphia sound to do soul music in the first place, it's like how many degrees of separation from the original <laughs> you know, acts do you want? I'm just saying it. I'm just putting it out there, you know. Yeah, well, I think the whole plastic, though, the brilliant thing that, you know, to go back to Bowie just briefly, the brilliant thing that he did about that is he cut everybody off before they could get to him, didn't he? The, the most obvious critique that he would have from people was, this isn't real, this isn't authentic, How, what, what kind of soul music is this? You know, you're from Beckenham. And of course, he said, well, it's just my version, it's plastic soul. So, but um, but you're right, because they're, they're, how many times can you dilute that when it just becomes, you know, copy of a copy of a copy but they they were a good band and all that it just wasn't for me there is a kind of a, a, a vague mention of Bowie in there saying that the clobber that they wore sometimes mm. the suits that they wore uh, a la pinups so Bowie on the yeah. back of pinups with his saxophone it mentions yeah. pinups but it's yeah crucially doesn't mention David Bowie so you have no. to wonder <laughs> if there was a little caveat at the beginning of the interview saying listen mate don't mention Bowie. <laughs> also, they get slightly irked. It says here, the, the group have done very few interviews lately in the weekly rock papers, and in the past six months have declined to talk to both Ian Penman and Paul De Neuer of this paper. The reason, according to Kemp, is they were fed up with having to continually justify themselves as people. He said, we do interviews and find ourselves sitting there representing the attitude of the majority of working class kids, but having to justify our whole lifestyle to somebody who was saying that it was wrong, and it really irritated me. It was uh, basically kids who are into acquisition and sharp clothes just didn't fit in with the treasured rock myth of street culture. Yeah, right, now this so. is good, and this is very pertinent as well, actually. There were always two sides to the original Blitz scene. There was a mm. high posy end, which tended to get in all the colour supplements. Then there were the other half, who were a very basic bunch of real boozers. So there was that, and that is that working class element that I was on about before, where it was an escape. And you can yeah. understand that, can't you? You don't, you, you know, you, you can have aspirations to be, because that's what Boy George came out of, and Marilyn, yeah. and, and all of those people, didn't they? You know, the trendsetters of the time. Yeah, definitely. Stop winking at... I saw that. Stop winking at the camera. I Where are we it. going now, Bob? Oh, well, do you know, I know this isn't pop music, but I've got to bring this up because, look, Enemy, 1981, uh, they report that the Village Voice don't like Lauren Hardy. Okay, their critic, uh, who is it, uh, Molly Haskell, says they're threatening to women and combine physical ruination with misogyny. 
All right. Mm. You and I are both big fans of uh, Lauren Hardy, of course. She says here that they are constantly expressing affection for each other. Uh, Lauren Hardy form a parody male female couple. Lauren Hardy ridicule older women, by implication, all women, with their disaster prone bodies and their exclusive relationship that not only shuts out women, but questions their very necessity. They constitute a two man wrecking team of female, that is, civilized and bourgeois society. That's the argument. Okay, there is, um, they've been cancelled, like in 1980. I'm yeah, looking at yeah. they, they got yeah, cancelled. Yeah. One of the first um, people to get cancelled there in that respect. But there is one weird scene. Is it the one where they're moving the piano, where one of them punches a woman in the face? <laughs> really? A real boom. Yeah. But obviously, I mean, it was just uh, it was uh, uh, even shocking when you would watch it. But right. I don't I don't think it was steeped in in mm. hatred of women. I think it was just like a, a really kind of shocking moment where you go yeah. oh my god nobody does that you wow. know okay but I, I you know i'm sure that they, they didn't punch anybody actually no i'm pretty sure they didn't all right we went uh, to the uh, laurel and hardy museum in Ulverston, <laughs> didn't we Oh, it was amazing what a day that was. I mean, that, we haven't got time for all that. But yeah, it was a very interesting museum, isn't it? It's got a very, what would you say, a down-home, um, unofficial feel about it. There's a lot of interesting stuff there, including, apparently, uh, Stan Laurel's original bed that he was born in, I believe. Yeah, OK, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> Sticking with TV. Anyway, go see the museum, it's great. Uh, Sticking with TV, 1981. Uh, Alexis Sale has appeared on Granada's Celebration series, which was a real tonic. Uh, apparently, it was a phony documentary format from Albanian television, which allowed a variety of stylistic devices, none better than the black and white clip from Benito, the story of a simpleton who rises to power as a fascist leader, principally because he's got a profile that looks very good on postage stamps. <laughs> great. great. Yeah, no, brilliant stuff. I don't remember that. But um, OK, look at the time. We need to go to a tune, don't we, Bob? We do, mate. Here's a tune.
I love that tune. Do you? Definitely. Fantastic. Okay, then. So um, we're looking now at the Gang of Four, and um, you go through it, Bob, because I have got a little bit of a personal story. It's not too personal, don't worry. Uh, oh. that, that relates. All right, okay. So this is in the news section. Uh, Dave Allen's departure from the Gang of Four may have been amicable, that's inverted commas, by his standards, but it seems to have left the other three, that's Andy Gill, John King and Hugo Burnham, with a nasty taste in the mouth, uh, judging from a joint statement they issued this week. They said they say they had intended to maintain a no-comment stance, but they've now been obliged to reverse this attitude after reading Allen's fictions, again, in inverted commas, in last week's NME. So this all stemmed from the fact he decided to leave during an American tour didn't he and the others are, are claiming that he really left them in the lurch but he did uh, you know for, uh, for whichever way you want to look at it he we were staying in the same hotel as a gang of four on the day that dave allen left the band so it was the iroquois oh. hotel on west 44th street i think it was a trip to new york where we opened for the clash where they mm. had mm, like 18 dates at the Bonds Casino at or Bonds, whatever, yeah. with a different band every night. Many of them British. I imagine Gang of Four were one of them, could be wrong. But there was, I do remember them having a little bit of a conflab in the uh, reception of the Iroquois. And mm. then they're like, what's going on? Have the bass players left Gang of Four? Um, so it, it, it was ah. it was just like that by the yeah. look of it, you know. And so, and I know at that point in time, they had to go out and look for somebody else. And then yeah. it was probably, it must have been the long jaunt that we did to um, America where we drove across because we ended up uh, naturally on the West Coast. And mm. we went to see them, I think it was in Berkeley Stones, one of the Stones venues over there in California. We went to see Gang of Four. They got their act together and they were out on the road again. And it was Buster Cherry Jones playing yeah. bass for them. Um, so, uh, and, and we went over and said hello to them at the end of it and all that. You know, we didn't know them particularly. Um, mm. But um, yeah, so that that is kind of my experience of that. And it did seem at that point in time, at least, mm. that it was just at the drop of a hat that he left. Well, there's obviously a lot of bad blood here, isn't it? Yeah, as you mentioned then. So the remaining gang of three claim it was Alan who wanted to crack the American market in the first place. And he was the one who persuaded them to undertake a four and a half week tour instead of a three week schedule. Uh, and the statement from the band says uh, the tour was budgeted to make a small profit. Dave leaving puts the rest of us in debt to the tune of £7,600 from the tour. That leaves us worse than broke. War. I remember when we went over there, it was something that we were looking forward to do, doing, obviously. And... And they were great. Like I say, we did the East Coast and the West Coast on one tour, and then the East Coast drove across, then West Coast. And we loved it. But it is funny, you know, how many bands, it's their kind of goal to try and get over to America. But it is so tough. We weren't bothered about breaking America. We just yeah. wanted to go and have a, you know, play and go to these mad cities, going to Tucson and places like that. Mm. We never thought we were going to crack it. You know, just a ridiculous concept for the fall in that respect anyway. Um, but a lot of bands go over there and it's almost the death of them. You know, yeah, it's hard yeah. work. It is a hard work. I, I always have a laugh with uh, Trace about the fact that whenever there's anything kind of taxing or whatever, I say, yeah, but, you know, I had 16 hours in a van with Mark Smith. <laughs> I can't remember where it was from, but it was too too song, um, and, and it was just a joke at Mark's expense. Sorry, Mark. Yeah. Um, but you know that's always like the, uh, the yardstick of hardship. Yeah, that's quite okay, a good phrase. Enough. Actually, I'm, like, I'm not going to comment. Is that a um, was that your first tour of the states then? Eighty one. Would that be the first time the four had gone over? No, I think or that was the like... second one. All right, okay. Fine. I've just been reading uh, Will Sargent's book, his second volume, Echoes of the, but and, and that is about their first tour as well in '81, actually, funny enough, in, of the states. And that, as you've mentioned, that it's just this grueling trek, spending all day in vans, passing amazing scenery and whatnot. But it is just that these vast distances that bands don't even think twice about covering if you, if you're from the states in the first place. I do remember we were helped out enormously by the fact that we had a big plastic bin full of ice and beer. Oh, really? That helped. Yeah, I'm sure it did. Sure Drink it responsibly. Did. Jim Carroll, author, poet, musician. So if people have seen or read the book, The Basketball Diaries, which was his a pretty harrowing account of growing up. He was a heroin addict at age 13, wasn't he? And he grew up on the, on the streets. I think he went to a very sort of posh school, but he rejected all that. He was uh, sort of good at sport, but just gave it all up for this fairly squalid life from an early age and then came out the other side of it as a poet and an author and also as a record maker so catholic boy was the album he'd made at this point in 81 
Yeah, I mean, it says here his best-selling American debut LP, <laughs> Catholic Boy. I wonder how many it sold, because I thought... It was a mate of mine, Moe, introduced me to this record, and yeah. it's brilliant. There's a, there's a tune that we play every now and then called People Who Died, mm -hmm. which is kind of the centrepiece of the album. Yeah. And it is really great, and it, it does just... It's a catalogue of all of this disaster and tragedy around him, as you say, probably steeped in the fact that it's a heroin culture that he has come from. But mm -hmm. I thought it was a real underground album, and, and then he became a bit of a darling after that with the film, but maybe not because the, the names that he's dropping in this particular mm. interview, they're all in there, aren't they? Patti Smith and Bob Dylan, and, you know, you can see him hanging out with Bruce Springsteen or whatever. Yeah, it's a strange one, isn't it? I mean, there's obviously a lots of different sort of sides to this whole story, and he's a little bit wary. He's in the UK at this point doing some press to promote uh, Catholic Boy, and he's going he's decided to do one day of sort of press interviews. As you say, he's very, very wary about the sort of questions, because they tend to be the same kind of things, almost accusatory things, you know, about the fact that, are you just cashing in on the fact that, you, you know, from drug culture, are you sort of making a fast book out of this? That's been the main thing that really annoys him. Uh, a lot of people saying that he exploits death. Uh, apparently he was nominated for Pulitzer at age 22, which is sort of thrown at him as, as, as a bit of a negative. Uh, and he's cashing in on the heroin addiction, uh, seven years now behind him, for a newfound rock image. So he really can't win. So he's having to explain himself constantly here. Uh, he says he's the first to admit it took him a while for things to get right with the band. He's totally committed, it says, to a form of continuing literary experimentation, which includes rock, but seems most inspired by the work of his mate, the playwright Sam Shepard. So he's got a foot in both camps, hasn't he, still? And Sam Shepard, and obviously, rock. interwoven in the career of Patti Smith as well. Yeah, so he's almost like a male Patti Smith <clears throat> in some kind of respect, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. But, of course, again, he's... he's got people fighting. Dustin Hoffman wants to buy the rights to Diaries at this point in time, but Paul yeah. Schrader wants them as well. That's right. Um, I don't know who eventually made the Basketball Diaries. It had uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, he was the lead character, wasn't right. he, in that? Uh, it says Carol isn't actually interested in how his youthful self will be, will be scripted or acted. Uh, just uh, give me the money, he says, and, and sod it. That's his attitude. You nearly well, said you fuck it then, which would mean that <laughs> Howard would have to beep it. So I'm glad that you didn't, mate. Oh, I'm going to say fuck a few times here then. So you're talking about him knowing sort of famous people. He says here he, he had an early meeting with Mick Jagger when Catholic Boy was supposed to be produced by Keith Richards, which I didn't realise. Well, he says that Keith Richards kept going on about getting airplay. And so right. he's coming at it from the wrong an angle, because if he's from yeah. the St. Mark's boho scene in New yeah. York and he's talking about getting airplay and uh, immediately <laughs> selling yourself down the river... Keith Richards is completely barking up the wrong tree. Yeah, totally. Mick Jagger says, he was telling me I had to write some boy-girl songs, some songs about fuck I'm not getting fuck or the whole range of limited possibilities there. I like Jagger, but he just wouldn't, underst wouldn't understand why I couldn't do that. And it says Carol's anger is also real at another point in conversation where he derides singers who sell themselves as just a good f***. Uh, and then, then when we're talking about the relative femininity or masculinity of viewpoints and aims, I'm surprised at the reason he gives for not having more defined views. He says, I don't live in my body enough anymore. It's just like the shell that I carry around with me. You've got a filthy mouth on you, Bob Hughes. All that, all that censoring that Howard and Jason are going to have to do. It's just... They love it. Okay, so uh, where to now then, Bob? I saw that. Album reviews, Wire, Document and Eyewitness at Notre Dame Hall and the Electric Ballroom is out on rough trade. So Wire, 1981 and no more, they, they split up. Mm. So this is a, well, like it says on the tin, a document of them in live performance. Very uncompromising to the last. Yeah, um, one of my favourite bands, uh, you know, and I've got to know them, particularly Colin and Graham, you know, um, but they are brilliant. Uh, but the great thing that comes across in this is the fact that they started out kind of uh, as a punk band you know and obviously mm. there's so so much more than that but li live at the Roxy one to XU and that it's, it's pretty edgy and obviously they wanted to fit into the scene and they just come from a band with another singer I do remember that much yeah. and, it, and, it, and it morphed into Wire uh, but then pretty much immediately they did go down and I hope they don't hate me for this but the art rock movement because obviously I mean Colin went to art school I can't remember which one it was but Brian Eno was one of his his tutors 
right. did lectures there and stuff. And mm. he, he was telling me not that long ago that he used to get a lift home from from, from one of the other tutors with Brian Eno because he'd go past <laughs> Colin's house on the way to Eno's house. Um, so <laughs> so the art kind of, it's well, undeniable that, mm. that they were involved mm. in the kind of art, the playful art scene, if you yeah, like. Yeah, definitely. But there's loads of things here about them, um, like Graham bashing an old stove. So this is the, obviously they're doing these shows, weren't they? And they say they've got no. Well, it wasn't like lack of respect for the audience, lack of respect for sort of just doing the conventional thing. Yeah, That's what it's all about, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, where the spectators would have been satisfied with the cosy illusion of a load of greatest hits, and why I demanded they should participate with their imaginations by playing totally unfamiliar sets. Did that make them arrogant? On the contrary, they were crediting their followers with uh, intelligence to grapple with the unknown. Goes on to as you. For example, where, why did the group keep disappearing behind a sheet? Why is Graham hammering away at an old stove? What's the singer doing with that lit up goose in his hand? Uh, don't ask me, just laugh or throw something. However, they created a vicious tension between audience performers, which has been caught on record, making this one of the most compulsive live records in a long time. It is funny, because I'd never thought about this, really. Um, but there is a comparison to be drawn with the four, because we, we had a reputation for alienating the audience, but not with strange props and doing strange things it was about doing nothing in the, in a certain respect <laughs> yeah, you know yeah, yeah, yeah. i mean yeah. famously mark smith used to do quite a lot of work with his back to the audience and mm. we would always play i would say probably at least 50 percent of the set the audience wouldn't have heard before and we might mm. have even just started rehearsing it that night in the sound check but it never been released on record and so there is a definite parallel to be drawn with yeah. wire here though like i say they were coming from the art movement and we were yeah. just coming from the surly movement yeah, absolutely. I like that. A mate of mine went to see Wire once, and the support a support band was a Wire tribute act. Yeah, so that's where they were coming from. Yeah, I remember them doing that. Brilliant. Just fabulous. All right, then. Where should we go next? Uh, do you think we should go to the charts? I think we probably should. We should go to the indie charts, shouldn't we? Definitely. Okay, then. So, uh, do you want me to start, Bobbert? Go on. Not okay. Go. So, the singles, then. Here we are. At 30, Bloody Revolutions, Crass... Uh, 29, Holiday in Cambodia, Dead Kennedys. 28, Ceremony, 12-inch remix, New Order. Uh, 27, Hobby for the Day, Wall. 26, Feet, Charlie Harper. Uh, 25, Nagasaki Nightmare by Crass. Uh, 24, Chance Meeting, Joseph K. Uh, 23, Bella Lugosi's Dead, Bauhaus. 22, Something Sends Me to Sleep, Felt. At 21, the Resurrection EP, Vice Squad. At 20, in the Grey Light EP, Virgin Prunes. At 19, Don't Let It Pass, UB40. 18, watching the Hyperplanes, Tunnel Vision. At 17, Brave New England, Walter Mitty's Little White Lies. At 16, Go For Gold, Girls At Our Best. At 15, I Don't Want To Live With Monkeys, The Hicksons. 14, Dole Age, Talisman. 13, Dreaming Of Me, Depeche Mode. 12, Too Drunk, Dot Dot Dot, Dead Kennedys. 11, R Swimmer, Wire. 10, Puppets of War EP, Cron Gen. At 9, the Wicker Rap, The Evasions. At 8, Little Red Riding Hood, 999. At 7, Forget the Dawn by War. At 6, Q Quarters, The Associates. At 5, Another One Bites the Dust, that's General Saint and Clint Eastwood. At 4, Motorhead, Hawkwind. At 3, Papa's Got a Brand New Pig Bag by Pig Bag. At 2, Noise Smell, Flux of Pink Indians. At 1, New Life, Depeche Mode. Okie dokie. So moving on to the LP then, why don't we? At 30, Inflammable Material, Stiff Little Fingers. At 29, Hex, Poison Girls. 28, Feeding of the 5000, Crass. At 27, Action Battlefield, New Age Steppers. At 26, provisionally titled The Singing Fish, Colin Newman. At uh, 25, Hopelessly in Love, Carol Thompson. At 24, Fresh Fruit for Rotting Vegetables, Dead Kennedys. At uh, 23, Lubricate Your Living Room, Fire Engines. At 22, Stations of the Crass, Crass. At uh, 21, How the West Was Won, Toya. 20, To Each, Certain Ratio. At uh, 19, Odie Shake, The Raincoats. At 18, Prayers and Fire, Birthday Party. 17, In the Flat Field, Bauhaus. At 16, Firehouse Rock, Wailing Souls. At 15, He Who Dares, Theatre of Hate. 14, Dirk Wears White Socks, Adamant. 13, Live, Misty. At 12, Heart of Darkness, Positive Noise. At 11, Signing Off, UB40. At 10, Unknown Pleasures, Joy Division. At 9, Document and Eyewitness, Wire. Sorry. At 8, Closer, Joy Division. At 7, Black Sounds of Freedom, Black Uhuru. At 6, Punk's Not Dead, The Exploited. At 5, Anthem by Toya. At 4, Playing with a Different Sex, Au Pairs. 
At three, you present Arms, UB40. At two, the only fun in town, Joseph K. And at number one, Penis Envy by Crass. Okie dokie. So, um, we well, I think we're done, aren't we, Bob? We are, yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, just to say thanks very much for watching this, and uh, it is most certainly available as a probably one-and-a-half-hour version of the Parallel Universe on Patreon every Thursday morning at 8am, and you can subscribe, uh, subscribe for just £1 a week, which is ridiculously cheap. I agree with you, Mark. All right, so before we hear the last tune, just a reminder that straight after this broadcast, we're going to be doing a live Q&A. So that's me, Mark, Howard and Jason, where you can ask us anything you like and we will endeavour to answer. So um, we are at your beck and call. Enjoy. Thank you for listening to The Parallel Universe. The Parallel Universe was brought to you by me, Rob Hughes, Mark Riley, Howard Nock and Jason Reed. 